My name is Jim Fonseca. I'm a research scientist at Purdue University. Um, I'm in Gerhard Klimek's group. He <coughs> sort of wears two hats. He is uh, both the head of our research group and then also the director for the Network for Computational Nanotechnology, uh, which runs nanohub.org, which I'll, I'll mention. I've got one slide about that. Um, <coughs> so what does our group do? Uh, I should say, I think Elif was right, that uh, these talks seem to be getting more towards the engineering side of things. Um, so I, we're primarily, I would say we're a basic science group, but we're definitely in the area where we want to be able to simulate uh, kind of real world engineering devices. Um, in our case, these are basically gonna be transistors. <coughs> um, and we want to kind of exist in this area sort of between very small scale ab initio simulations where people are simulating you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of atoms. And then the, the TCAD area, which is uh, essentially what an industry uses now, where they've um, sort of say, you've got a, a big block of material and it has, you apply some quantum corrections to deal with atomistic uh, fluctuations. And so with NEMO 5, we have a uh, atomistic approach this is through uh, tight binding. Um, and basically this lets us do simulations sort of in the realm of like millions of atoms. Um, so it's, um, sorry. Uh, we like to say it's a multi-scale, multi-physics approach. Um, what that kind of means is you can uh, simulate different parts of your devices with say different physics models if you need to. Um, this allows us to you know, simulate very large devices, but have uh, perhaps different physics models in a part of the, of, of the device, which is um, um, <coughs> perhaps more important. Um, there are a variety of transport models that we have. Uh, we can do things like ohmic and shock key contacts. Um, strain models, uh, you know, I should mention there was a question that came up during lunch and um, so even though we're doing atomistic simulations, it's not anything like molecular dynamics. We essentially start with a predefined set of atomic coordinates. Um, we'll do strain, strain relaxation on it. But then once we have that, the atoms aren't moving around. Um, and we've actually done a lot more work uh, recently to be able to incorporate um, uh, sort of a variety of different structures. So one thing we're looking at is say, uh, copper contacts to a transistor. So you get some interesting uh, bonding configurations when you're bonding you know, two different materials like that. So we work on uh, doing, using DFT so that we can parameterize that interface um, and simulate that in a, the uh, tight binding approach. <coughs> um, I should also mention, besides the transistors, we also have some work on looking at, this is a picture of a quantum dot. It's kind of like a, it's like a spiky Easter egg. Uh, these are just kind of the, uh, the, showing the directions of strain of these atoms. Um, and then we have kind of a four level uh, parallelization scheme. Uh, just a quick slide on kind of NEMO 5 and its relation to NanoHub. <coughs> so uh, NEMO 5 is uh, free to use for academic research. Uh, you can download it, we've got a support group. Um, in fact, you can run uh, NEMO 5, a pre-compiled binary on Purdue resources as well. Um, so nanohub.org is a, I guess it's a, like say a cyber infrastructure uh, for, sci for science. Um, uh, it's got quite a few users. A lot of the resources, and they should say that all these resources are um, you know, committed by the, the community. Um, so anybody can upload if you've got a presentation or slides or a tutorial on something, anything uh, really nano uh, related, you can do that. Uh, one of the cooler f uh, features is that it has simulation tools. And so that if you have a tool like NEMO 5, uh, what NanoHub lets you do is build a nice GUI uh, wrapped around that tool. Um, so people can go to, go to the website, run this basically right in their web browser. Uh, then the tool is running on uh, Purdue resources. So these are two of the tools that use NEMO 5 uh, as the engine. This is a NanoFET tool for uh, simulating 
uh, <coughs> transistors. Um, this is for quantum dot labs. I think this is showing some strain on a particular quantum dot. Um, so I've got two uh, kind of science, um, two science topics I wanted to talk about that we've kind of done in the past year or so. Um, so the first one, the main point here is that we're looking at non-trivial and disordered leads. So if you think of, if you look at the top right here, uh, if you think of a, basically a regular transistor, you've got this channel where electrons are going to flow through the middle of it. Um, with the kind of the typical, I should say NEGF is the non-equilibrium screens functions. So the, this is kind of the, one of the standard approaches to simulating uh, quantum transport devices. Um, generally, that assumes that the source and drain are ideal. Um, the problem is, is that as devices get smaller and smaller, the contacts, so the, basically the source and the drain, uh, become more important as far as their uh, influence on device uh, performance. Um, that's through things like roughness. Uh, if you've got random alloys, you have you know, atoms in sort of different locations. Uh, the non-periodic geometries, you can see how the, the geometry here uh, is kind of this trumpet shape. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Um, but basically, it's this uh, complex uh, absorbing potential that's been implemented for this approach. Um, <coughs> so here, again, we've got the, the channel. This is a SIGI channel, um, uh, kind of with a uh, disordered alloy and the silicon contacts on the left and right. Um, we've done this with. Uh, two different device lengths, so the 6 nanometers and the, and the 20 nanometers. Um, and then here on the left, we're just kind of showing transmission uh, versus the energy. And the, the, I guess the important thing to note is that once you add in the contacts, um, your transmission takes a big hit, um, both for the, the 6 nanometer here is, is in black, and then the 20 nanometer is in purple. Um, <coughs> But really the important thing to note is that um, you end up with getting about a 45% decrease in the on current. So the VCA is the virtual crystal approximation. Um, and then if you do the simulation with just the, uh, the alloy and the device, you've got this black line here. Uh, and then if you start doing the alloy and the device and contacts, you end up with this blue line. I should mention this is on a linear scale and just the log scale. Um, so this has a real effect if you're Intel and you're trying to make a SIGI transistor because now you just uh, cut your on current in half. Um, <coughs> another uh, sorry. Um, so another uh, graphene's been around for a while. People have been trying to turn it into transistors for a while. Um, we've done some other work in our lab where we've looked at uh, kind of making these and looking at nano ribbons. Because the, the main problem with graphene is that it has zero band gap. So if you want to get a transistor, you need to open up that band gap somehow. Um, which, like I mentioned, you can do that with turning into nano ribbons where you've got basically a thin sheet of graphene. Um, so another approach to opening up the, the band gap is that you can use bilayer graphene and if you apply an electric field, you can open up the band gap. Uh, you can see that here. So you end up with the uh, separation between the conduction and valence bands. Um, and we're working with uh, Professor Chen at Purdue. Um, so uh, she's an experimental group, so she's actually building these devices, uh, which are quite large. So this is 300 nanometers. Um, this is probably the best slide as far as why we need Thank you. Uh, Why well, we need blue waters, uh, you're looking at a device size of 100 nanometers by 200 nanometers by 20 nanometers uh, with about 3.2 million atoms. Uh, you end up with a very large matrix size once you get that into the uh, tight binding representation. Um, and here we've been able to um, get up to an on-off current of a uh, ratio of 100. Uh, which is still not very good as transistors are, are con uh, considered um, 
but this is sort of just uh, uh, the first work we've done on it. Um, and you can see the, the difference. So w essentially what's going on here is you've got the, uh, the top gate, which is here, is modulating, um, modulating the band gap um, and opening the band gap so you can control the current. Um, here's sort of the, the uh, uh, same results as the previous slide uh, with various voltages for the back gate. So you can see how that affects the, the, uh, the different IV characteristics as well. Um, and again, this is really just another example of how large these simulations are when you have these uh, 64 million by 64 million uh, matrices. Um, and then you have to get these things to converge, and so you're doing the uh, eigenvalue solution as well as taking the inverse of them. Um, and then that's essentially you have to do this convergence for each data point. Um, I guess with that, I'd like to thank Blue Waters and NSF for their support. Um, Ryan Mokos has been great as our point of contact. Um, the students who have done the work are highlighted in bold here. Uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, so it's sparse, so that helps a lot. <laughs> um, but we do, I mean, the, I mean, one of the, the where Blue, Blue Waters helps the most is that even though it is sparse, we, you use that when you're running one of these simulations, you kind of have to figure out, you know, what's the minimum number of nodes that I can, that I need um, in order to store my device. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.